Hey folks, welcome to lecture two of Advanced Linear Algebra, and this time we're going to talk all about subspaces. And the idea behind a subspace is it's just a vector space that lives within another vector space. Okay, and you actually saw subspaces back in your first linear algebra course, back when the only vector space that you had in mind was Rn. Okay, and remember back then a subspace was a thing like a line through the origin or a plane through the origin or a hyperplane in, through the origin if you're in higher dimensions. And those things still are subspaces because, well, they're vector spaces within vector spaces. Here, like the big vector space is Rn and the small vector space, the subspace, is the line or the plane or the hyperplane or whatever. Okay, but now we can talk about subspaces of arbitrary vector spaces as well. So subspaces of the other types of spaces that we saw in lecture one. So th things like subspaces of the set of matrices or subspaces of the vector space of functions. We're going to see things like that. Okay, so just generalizing things that we've already seen in regular linear algebra to, you know, the more general setting that we're looking at now. Okay, so how does it work? Yeah, subspace is just a vector space that lives within another vector space, and it has to use the same addition and scalar multiplication op operations. Okay, and we'll see one or two examples where that's sort of important. So it's got the same operations as the vector space that it's living inside of. Okay, and the reason that subspaces are really nice, the reason sort of that they have, have their own name, we don't just call them vector spaces to begin with, is if you already have an overlying vector space that you're living within, then you can determine whether or not the thing is a subspace really easily. You don't have to go back and check that laundry list of 10 properties that we saw in lecture one. Okay, if you want to determine if something's a subspace, you only have to check two properties. So it's a lot easier to determine whether something's a subspace than it is to determine if something's a vector space in general. Okay, and so here, here's how it works. Suppose that you've got some something V that you already know is a vector space, and then you've got some non-empty set S that's within V, okay? Then you can determine whether or not S is a vector space, in other words, whether or not it's a subspace, just by checking two of those 10 defining properties. The only two properties that you have to check are closure under addition and closure under scalar multiplication. If those two properties hold, then all of the other vector space properties hold and you just get that, yeah, S must itself be a vector space as well for free. You get the other eight properties automatically. Okay, so yeah, it's gotta be a subspace if and only if just these two properties hold. Okay, so our first goal in this lecture is gonna be proving this theorem. So let's just run through where the proof comes from really quickly here. All right, so it's an if and only if theorem, okay? It's a subspace if and only if these two properties hold here. So we gotta prove it in both directions. For the only if direction, we want to show that um, if S is a subspace, in other words, if it's a vector space, then these two properties hold. And this is just straightforward because if you go back, I'm going to go back now just to remind us of the, the definition of a vector space, we have to show that if those 10 properties that define a vector space hold, then these two properties in the theorem hold. Okay, well, let's, here's the, the 10 properties that define a vector space. And well, two of the properties here, this one, property A, and this one, property F, those are exactly the properties that we want. So if it's a vector space, if it satisfies all 10 of these properties, then yeah, it satisfies the two properties that we were mentioning in this theorem. So that's one direction, like it's just trivial, okay? The properties are just listed right there, okay? So this is property A, and in the original definition, this was property F. All right, but how do you go in the other direction? How do you use these two properties to show that the other, to show that that whole list of 10 properties holds? This is trickier because you gotta prove the other eight come for free. All right, so here's where sort of the bulk of the proof is. And first we're gonna focus on six of the properties, B, C, G, H, I, J. Of course, I don't expect you to remember what they are. Let's go back and look at maybe just, let's say B and C, just to get an idea of why these properties are, are all so similar for the purposes of this proof. So let's pro look at properties Let's start with property B maybe. All right, so property B says that in any vector space, addition is commutative. V plus W is the same as W plus V. Okay, now, why must this hold um, in S? Well, remember that like we've already got an overlying vector space V. We've got a vector, we've got a set V that we already know is a vector space. So this holds for everything in V. Let's go back to the theorem now. Okay, V plus W is the same as W plus V for everything in V, all right? For everything in V, V plus W is the same as W plus V. Well, if that's true for everything in V, then it's gotta be true for everything in S as well, because S is a subset of V, right? The things in S are in V, all right? So if addition is commutative in all of V, then it's commutative in all of S. 
So yeah, property B holds in S because it holds in V. And the same for these other five properties. They just follow automatically just because S is contained within V. Property C, this was associativity. If addition is associative for every vector in, in V, well, it's got to be associative for every vector in S as well, for all triples of vectors in S, just because the vectors in S are in V, okay? So those five properties just follow for free via that sort of logic. All right, and then we're left with two more properties that we've got to show hold. These are the tricky ones. So property D, property D was the statement that there are zero vectors in vector spaces, right? There's some vector that we call the zero vector with a property that when you add it to anything else, it doesn't change that anything else. So we've got to show that S has a zero vector. If we want it to be a vector space, it's got to have a zero vector. Okay, so here we're, get, we're again going to leech off of V a little bit. So the idea is we know that there's a zero vector in V. We just need to show that it's actually an S. Okay, we need to show that the zero vector is an S. And the way that we do that is we just note that, hey, if I take any vector in S and multiply it by the scalar zero, I'm going to get the zero vector. Okay, and this actually, this is not immediately obvious, but it's hinted at by the notation. It's why we use the notation terminology that we do, right? Here, like, the reason that this is not obvious, right? This is a vector times a scalar, and this is, you know, times a particular scalar zero. And this over on the right-hand side, this is a vector that's the additive identity. It's not obvious that these are the same, okay? But it's a theorem that they are the same. Uh, this theorem's proved in the textbook, if you're interested. We're just skipping it for time. Okay, so zero times V, that's the zero vector, but hey, we know by closure, right? If we just scroll back up to this, the statement of the theorem here, we're assuming that S is closed under scalar multiplication. So I can multiply by any scalar here and I'll still be in, in S. I'm just choosing the scalar zero, All right? So zero times V has got to be in S. So therefore the zero vector is in S. And that's what I wanted, right? I wanted to show that the zero vector was in S. All right, and then property E is very, very similar, okay? Property E was the statement that um, every, every vector in your vector space had an additive inverse. In other words, for every vector V in your vector space, there's a negative V. There's a vector that when you add them together, you get the zero vector, all right? That was statement E, and we need to show that, okay? And again, we're gonna leech off of V here. We know that there's always a negative V in the overall vector space, big V, okay? We just need to show that that negative V is an S. Okay, because we want to show that S is a vector space. All right, so the way we do this, very similar trick to part D up above, okay? This time we're going to multiply by the scalar minus one. And again, we know that's an S because S is closed under scalar multiplication, right? So here I'm just choosing the scalar minus one, okay? And then again, there's a theorem that tells me, well, minus one times V, that's exactly the additive inverse of V. That's what we call negative V, okay? Again, the notation suggests that, but that's actually a theorem. There's a theorem buried in there. Okay, so again, that theorem's in the textbook and the proof of the theorem's in the textbook. So you can see that if you're interested. Again, we're just skipping for the sake of time. All right, and then that's it. Now we've shown that all 10 properties hold as long as these two properties hold. So if you want to check that something's a subspace, you just have to check these two properties here. So let's go through a couple examples of things that are and are not subspaces. And we'll see how much easier it is to check than it was checking vector spaces back in the previous lecture. All right, so... First example is uh, is this set, we, we denote it by funky little script P with a, a P up in the superscript, P to the power of P, that's the set of real valued polynomials with degree at most P, okay? So in other words, it's the set of functions that look something like this, right? Some scalar plus some scalar times X plus some scalar times X squared, all the way up to some scalar times X to the power of P. That's a degree P or less than or equal to P polynomial. It's strictly less than P if, uh, you know, this scalar might be zero. All right, so the question is, is the set of all of those polynomials, is that a subspace of the, of the set of real valued functions, which we denote by this funky script F here? All right, so to check this, to determine whether or not this is a subspace of this guy, we just have to check those two properties from the previous theorem. We have to check, well, if I add up two polynomials, do I still get a polynomial? If I take a polynomial times a scalar, do I still get a polynomial? And sort of when I say those things, you should immediately think to yourself, well, like, yeah, th th those are true, right? I mean, adding up polynomials, it's a polynomial. Scalar, of a, scalar multiple of a polynomial is a polynomial. But let's sort of write things down here and see how I check it. All right, so what we do is we start off with two polynomials in the set of polynomials, okay? And just giving names to the coefficients in Q over here. Then what happens when we add them up? Well, the sum of these two polynomials when it's applied to x is just 
the sum of each of them individually applied to x. And then p of x is just this expression over here. q of x is this one over here. And then we're just going to group coefficients just to make it a little bit more clear what's going on here. Here's the constant term of what you get when you add up these two polynomials. Here's the power of x term and so on. Here's the x to the power p term. And yeah, this is a polynomial of degree at most p, right? Here's the constant term. Here's degree one term and so on. It is a polynomial. So great. Um, so yeah, property A is satisfied. Property B is similar. You just check that if I take this polynomial P and multiply it by some scalar, it's still a polynomial. Well, yeah, it is, right? Okay, so nothing fancy happening there. Let's do another quick example. All right, so is the set of N by N real symmetric matrices a subspace of M, N of R, okay? So just notes on terminology and notation. A symmetric matrix, it's just a matrix that equals its own transpose. So that's what this means here. A symmetric matrix just means that the transpose of the matrix is the same as itself. Remember, transpose, what you do is you, you, take the, you flip the matrix across its main diagonal. So this just basically means the stuff up and to the right of the main diagonal is the same as the stuff, you know, down and to the left of the main diagonal, all right? And M sub N of R, that's just a set of N by N real matrices. All right, so to check whether or not the set of real symmetric matrices is a subspace, you just have to check these two properties. You have to check that if, I, if, I, if you add up two symmetric things, you get a symmetric thing. And if you take a symmetric matrix and multiply it by a, a scalar, is it still a symmetric matrix? Okay, so here's how it goes. Suppose you've got two symmetric matrices, A and B. Well, if I add them up, is it still symmetric? So in other words, if I add them up and then take the transpose, do I just get that matrix back itself? Okay. Um, and yeah, you do, right? Remember one of the properties of the transpose, not just with symmetric matrices, but with any matrix is if you take the transpose of a sum, you can split that up over the sum. It's A transpose plus B transpose. And then because A and B are both symmetric, I can just get rid of those transposes, right? So I'm just left with A, a plus B transpose is the same as A plus B. So A plus B is symmetric. Great, that's what I wanted. All right, the set of symmetric matrices is closed under addition. Now I want to check closure under scalar multiplication. Okay, so here I start off with some symmetric matrix and some real scalar. And now I just check, well, if I multiply that matrix by the scalar and then transpose it, does it leave it alone? Okay, I want that matrix to be unchanged because I want this matrix CA to be symmetric. And yeah, right, if I do a scalar times a transpose, again, one of the properties of the transpose is that, well, the transposing doesn't do anything to the scalar, right? Okay, so it's just C times A transpose. Just think about how everything works entry-wise, right? You're just trans. It doesn't matter where, whether you multiply the scalar uh, before or after you do the transpose. It's all the same. And then, because A transpose is the same as A, because A is symmetric, these two are the same as well. So yeah, C times A is symmetric, and it all works out. So because properties A and B both hold, yes, the set of real symmetric matrices is a subspace of M N of R. Okay, and notice how much uh, quicker and easier it was to go through these two examples than it was to go through the vector space examples in the previous lecture. In the, in the previous lecture, we had to go through a list of 10 properties to show that something was a vector space. Here, we've shown that these two sets, the, the degree P polynomials and the real symmetric matrices, those are vector spaces, right? Subspaces are vector spaces, but because they live within other vector spaces, it's a lot easier to show that they're vector spaces, okay? And we're going to see that a couple more ways. When you have a vector space in, in another vector space, it's just easier to work with. It's easier to prove things about. Okay, uh, so one more example. Uh, is the set of two by two matrices with determinant equal to zero, is that a subspace of the set of all two by two matrices? All right, and I don't know, the answer is just sitting right here, so no. And to see that the answer is no, we just have to show that at least one of these properties, A or B, uh, does not hold. We have to show that one of them is false, okay? So I'm going to show the property A does not hold. I'm going to show that this set of matrices with determinant zero, it's not closed under addition, all right? And one way to, to see that is, I mean, you can just prove it by example, right? If you're showing that something does not hold, you just need a single counter example. And so the ex counter example that I'm going to do is this matrix here that has a one in the top left corner and this matrix here that has one in the bottom right corner and every other entry equals zero. It, uh, it's not hard to check that the determinants of these two matrices are both equal to zero. They're not invertible matrices, so their determinants are zero. But if you add them up, you get the two by two identity matrix, which has determinant one, okay? So if you add them up, you get something that's deter whose determinant is not zero, right? So no, it's not a subspace because it's not closed under addition, okay? If it were a subspace, I would need to, it needed to have the property that if I took two things in that set and added them up, it would still be in that set, but that's not true. So it's not a subspace. 
Okay, and there's maybe one more really sort of uh, more technical example. Let's go back and look at the final example of a vector space that we saw back in lecture one. We had this weird example here where we had this vector space V. It was the set of positive real numbers, except addition and scalar multiplication on it were weird, right? Addition was defined via, you know, usual multiplication, and scalar multiplication was defined via exponentiation. And we showed that this is a vector space. Okay, and certainly this set here, the set V is contained within the real line, right? It's contained within the set of real numbers and the set of real numbers is also a vector space. So it seems natural to think at first that, hey, set of real numbers is a vector space. This is a vector space living inside it. So, hey, this set V here, this must be a subspace of R, the set of real numbers, right? It turns out that no, it's not. Okay, and the reason for that comes back to sort of this technical note that I made earlier on, that a, a subspace, it has to use the same addition and scalar multiplication operations as the vector space that it's living within. Okay, so the set of real numbers, well, it's got a particular, you know, scalar multiplication and addition operations that are just sort of the obvious ones. But then that vector space V, it had weirder different addition and scalar multiplication operations. So it's not a subspace of the, the set of real numbers. Okay, even though like it's a subset of that, it really does live within it, but it's not a subspace.